Thank you for being here today. Um, I know it's kind of early, especially if you went out to enjoy uh, San Antonio last night, so I appreciate you making it. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do under the title uh, Good Athlete Project is, is highly, uh, hi deeply rooted in psychology. It's a lot of character-based stuff, and I'm always really excited when, uh, when people show up for these sorts of discussions at a performance-based conference like this. I'm telling you, I think what we are doing what we're lucky to do in all those organizations that, I, that she mentioned I was a part of uh, is some of the most important uh, work going on in sports right now. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a little biased because I'm directly in it, but I tell you, like, as, a, as, as I reflect on my own career, okay, as an athlete, I played 16 seasons of football, and I've been a power lifter since I was very young. Um, as I reflect on my own career as an athlete, as I reflect on uh, decades now, which is kind of scary to say, of coaching, of being a professional in this space, this is some of the most important work uh, that is being done. I mean it, and I hope that today will sort of convince you of that, but also really lead to a discussion. And that's what I really like. That's why I appreciate these opportunities so much. I, there's no one way to do anything. We all know that. That's very, very clear. There's no clear A to B uh, in athletics, in strength and conditioning, in life. And everyone knows that. But I do think what, um, what opportunities like this to speak and share information offer is the beginning of what I hope will be a long-term relationship with a large body of coaches. So that's the first thing I've got to say is if anything even mildly appeals to you and you'd like to learn more about it, hear more about what we do or learn how to do it at your place, please reach out. We, uh, we got our, our guy Alex is, is roaming around somewhere. There he is, uh, roaming around somewhere. We really highly prioritize intercoach communication. We want to share ideas. We're going to give you a lot of our best stuff today. But again, I hope it doesn't end at 1035 or whenever this does. So <clears throat> one of the things that we try to do is maximize the potential of athletics as education. And that's a statement that I think goes under-recognized. Sports as sports, I, I, I don't think it's good enough. Like I said, I played 16 seasons of football. Um, I wasn't big, strong, or talented enough to make it to any significant level, but I did play some arena football, played overseas for a little while, and, and I think maximized at least my own ability, right? But if my career had ended at, at our last championship in Belfast, Ireland, it would have been really cool. It would have been a, a story for the bar, for a conference like this, uh, but it wouldn't have been enough. If what we do in the sports arena isn't education in a, in a continuing, lifelong sense, I think no matter how good it goes, it's, it's a missed opportunity. So this is just a, uh, a few quick examples of what we do. The top left is a, is a 5K, an annual 5K we run in Chicago. Top right is the, uh, addressing the crowd at the Illinois High School Powerlifting Association. That has now become, just in case you're curious, um, about 30 member schools deep and growing. We host um, uh, six regionals across the course of the year, a 200-person invite-only state championship. And what we're talking about in that frame is uh, mental health, how to support people and their mental health concerns. And we do it uh, in a way that is not sort of beating people over the head with what, what some people might call soft ideas. We enter a space very organically and authentically and capitalize on the potential of that space and talk about the stuff that really really matters, right? We've got NFL fullbacks talking about mindfulness. We're talking about mental health, the state championship for powerlifting meet. We're using sports in a way that, that doesn't always happen. So a lot of what we discuss today is going to be about ways of thinking. I mentioned there's no one-to-one, -one, there's no A to B in anything in life. So if we talk about delivering life lessons to young people, I think that's one of the clear things that, that, that should be addressed. There is no automatic. If you have grit, you will be better. It's not quite as clear cut as that, okay? Um, it's called complex causality. I'll get into that in a minute. First of all, before I go on, what's the answer to this question? Uh, who said it? I appreciate you being bold, not being afraid. But in this case, you're incorrect. Um, it's not two, and obviously this is kind of a setup, you get it, but it's, it's not two, okay? What we're trying to do is recognize uh, the, the complex causal relationships within the world. One pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry is still one pile of laundry. It's bigger, it's one pile of laundry. One wad of chewing gum and another wad of chewing gum, that's one wad of chewing gum, okay? And this is not to, be, like, this is not, I don't want to embarrass you in, I'm sorry, Scott, not meant to embarrass anyone or be sort of a cheap trick. It's only meant to suggest that the way that we label things really influences how we look at things, uh, and, and that can oftentimes be faulty. Because like I said, the world is not linear. We try to make it so because that's easier to digest, but it's just not linear. It's complex, it's relational, it's causal, and you get that. This is not a trick. Scott, what is this? 
It's a mosquito, and you're right this time. That's 50%. So a uh, mosquito, I'm sorry, dude, uh, a mosquito. In 1965, in Borneo, this might be a familiar story to some, uh, there was a malaria outbreak, a very serious one. Very serious malaria outbreak. And thinking sort of linearly, what they did to address that concern, they knew mosquitoes were carriers of malaria, so they just sprayed poison everywhere. They sprayed DDT to get rid of the mosquitoes, thinking that this would solve the problem. Mosquitoes are the issue. Let's get rid of the mosquitoes. Fair enough. What happened? Well, one thing that happened is roofs started collapsing in on people. So roofs are falling down. Thatch roofs falling in on people. And why? You wouldn't necessarily link these two. So people dug a little deeper. Again, today we're going to talk a lot about ways of thinking. They dug a little deeper and found out what was happening. Well, caterpillars were eating away at the organic tissue that was holding the thatched roofs together. Why is that an issue and why is it related? Well, those caterpillars, the population of caterpillars, used to be kept in check by wasps, which, when the mosquitoes were sprayed and killed, also died. So now the caterpillars are running wild and, and roofs are collapsing in on people. You wouldn't think about it naturally, uh, but if you dig a little deeper, you might. Worse still, those poisoned mosquitoes were being consumed by small lizards and things like that, little pests in the forest. So now you've got these essentially poisoned pests that are living only just long enough to be consumed by something else. It was the jungle cats. So jungle cats eating these poisoned lizards which had eaten the poisoned mosquitoes. Now those things are dying off, and rats take over. The rats brought with them the plague. So in really well-intended efforts of combating malaria, we unintentionally caused a ripple effect that started a plague. Okay? What was the solution? They dropped cats in on parachutes, and that's not, I wish that was a joke. They dropped cats into, I think it was the UK public, system of public health, uh, dropped cats into the jungles of Borneo to eat the rats and, and call the rat population. So look, uh, it, that sounds complicated. It sounds complex, but I will tell you that what's going on between the ears of your athletes and going on relationally in the, in the locker rooms, in the weight rooms, uh, it, it's equally complex. And I hope that's not too intimidating. And if it even seems a little bit intimidating, I hope you'll um, recognize two very real truths. Good coaching is a complicated process. It just is. Okay? Sometimes it'll feel easy and feel organic. And I believe that everyone in the room is a natural coach. And I think that's fantastic. But I hope you natural coaches are willing to dig a little deeper, get a little bit better every year. And I know I'm talking to the right group because you are at this professional development conference. The NSCA does a wonderful job with this stuff. Um, but we, we just got to embrace that truth. The other truth is this. And I'll tell you, we've been really lucky, and I, I didn't give much of my bio, but um, through the Good Athlete Project, we, we've had the privilege of working with thousands, thousands of kids, high school level, thousands at the college level, hundreds of coaches at each, each level, professional athletes, Olympic athletes, Olympic coaches. We've moved on to professionals in business who are doing very, very well. And some of these questions, when we pose them to them, some of these frameworks, have, uh, they've found most valuable, and that's why we're sharing today. This comes up every time, just about every time. You don't always have to be right, okay? And we talk about how potentially complex and complicated these situations can be. This is a really handy tool to have in your back pocket. You don't always have to be right, folks. But you should operate thoughtfully. You should have humility in the presence of setbacks, which are inevitable. And you've got to forgive yourself and those around you. You can both hold yourself to an incredibly high standard and forgive yourself. And in fact, I think they're mutually enhancing. And of course, you've got to be willing to adapt. And if you miss any piece of this, the rest of the pieces, especially the adaptation to, to fuel top-end results, becomes far more difficult. That could be obvious enough. This is, uh, this is the, like, sort of the core mantra. This is our working model. It's the cornerstone of every consultation that we go into. Does your behavior match your goal? We're going to get back into this later in the presentation, but I hope that you'll be willing to confront this. I'm telling you, like I said, we'll go into really high-achieving places with high-achieving people, put this up on the board, and it makes people very uncomfortable. And you can imagine what that looks like. Project this onto your own life. Does your behavior match your goal? There's a sometimes uncomfortable level of accountability that comes with that. It's your behavior. Okay? Does your behavior match your goal? But it's your behavior and it's your goal. And the your goal part is the key to a lot of this work. Okay? The your goal. It's got to be your goal, nothing imposed upon you. Now, 
Uh, this, is, uh, this is a grocery store, a modern grocery store. Let's let it serve as a metaphor for the really complex and complicated modern landscape that we all live in. And if you don't think that the supercomputer in your pocket has made this both the most efficient, most fun, and also most complicated time to be alive, uh, we got to look close. Because all of those are true. Okay, I'm not, I, I love my freaking cell phone, okay? I have an unhealthy relationship to my cell phone on certain days, but I will kind of come back and check it. It's a very valuable tool. It also, in the wrong hands or without intentionality, can, can take us off track very quickly. So this is the complicated landscape we live in. Imagine yourself coming off a long day of work. You stop by the grocery store, and you enter one of the most highly cultivated barrages of, of sight and sound and color and smell and billions of dollars of advertising aimed directly at you. That is a hard place to navigate if you're just hungry and you don't really know what you're in there for. Maybe you come out an hour and a half later and you got a king-sized bag of Skittles and, or, or Oreos or something like that. And I know this from experience. This is not just from the textbooks, folks. That, that can happen to someone. Um, but if you go into the same atmosphere and you say, I want a steak for dinner, Okay, the snake's not just going to fall into your lap, but you've got a direction. You can start reading signs. You can ask for help as needed, and you've got a little bit of a path, a little bit of a purpose. You've got a mission, right? And when it comes down to that question, does your behavior match your goal, a really important first part, I'm going to continue to come back to this, is, is the goal. It's your goal. Do you know what your goal is, and can you map your behaviors onto it accordingly? Okay, it's just a, it's a framework to continually come back to. This is our goal within what we call the Beyond Strength Initiative. It's become a really, really important part of the work of the Good Athlete Project. We host, uh, host, we host clinics regularly with this same title. We're going to be out in uh, Colorado Springs in April if anyone's interested. But uh, we also consult gyms. We do all sorts of important work. And what we do is we capitalize on one's desire to be a good athlete and do our best to make sure they become a, a good human. Right? In athletics, there's this incredible motivation to be good at what you do. Okay, on the lowest level, just be accepted to be one of the one of the guys or one of the girls, and on the highest level of a team, to be excellent at that sport. Uh, the motivation is already there, and I'm going to use this opportunity actually to give a little bit more of my of my background and explain why I think it's so important. So, I mentioned I was an athlete for a long time. Um, I also love to study. Th that's a nerdy thing to say. I went to Northwestern University for my first master's degree. My second was at Harvard University. And I was sitting in an educational neuroscience classroom in Harvard when we were going over the attention networks of the brain that should yield the most effective learning environment that exists. And it was just like a bullet point. It's novelty. It's, it's uh, uh, goal-oriented behavior. It's, it's collaboration. It's powerful mentorship and leadership. All these things. Something called exercise-induced neural enhancement. And I'm sitting in the back of this lecture hall like, guys, that platform already exists. That was like the first light bulb. That platform exists. The ideal learning environment exists, and, and I, I just happen to be in it. It's sports. And through sports, strength and conditioning, the second light bulb that went off was we're not using it to its full capacity. And you know that's true, okay? Sports gone wrong is a daily headline, okay? And, and, and it's sort of a, a more moderate version of that would be an, an underutilized version of sports, sports just to win a championship, say, would be missed opportunity. So we decided there's this incredible direction already in this platform. We got to get back in it and make sure it's used well. Motivation can be really, really powerful. Um, but it's, a, it's pretty clear that motivation requires a motive. So one thing that I hope everyone will sort of come out of this weekend with is an idea of what your motives are and what are the motives of your kids. That's all very, uh, it's all essential to what we're trying to do. I remember the day when I really wanted a big bench press, and I remember the day when I no longer cared if I had a big bench press, okay, just for, for uh, the sake of this conversation. I remember those days. And I think very deeply on this because when it comes to motivation, I think there's, there's always two edges to it. The first is, uh, who cares about a big bench press? I don't really anymore, no offense to anyone in the room who does, um, because I think life lessons matter so much more than numbers. I think the process of getting a big bench press matters so much more than the actual big bench press. That's where I'm at, okay? But when you talk about motivation, you have to recognize that some people do care about a big bench press. We, uh, you know, we, we work with a soccer team. On Tuesdays, they sometimes will bench press. Why? Not because I think it's going to make them incredible soccer players, but because those guys get so freaking jacked up 
for bench day, just the mere mention of it. They just, they want it, that we have to be there with them. That's not, you know, that's not where we course correct. If that's what they want, we're going to help them get there. So recognize that the kids do care, and we should be right there with them. You've got to meet people where they are. You have to if you want to take them where they need to be, okay? Meet people where they are to take them where they need to be. It's up to you all as coaches. It's up to us to recognize what could and should happen at the back end of an athletic career, right? But you can't just impose right away. You've got to meet people where, you, where they are to take them where they need to be. So it's one of the sort of other really important ideas that we've come across regularly. Are you a motivation or an imposition? Meaning, and this, is, this was a tough thing, honestly, for me to uh, confront personally. Are you a motivator or, uh, or, you are imp- or are you imposing your ideals on a young population? That's a legitimate thing to ask. Now, you might know what's best. You're more experienced. You're very thoughtful. You've been in the game. You've been coaching for a while. I, I believe that, okay? But I think it's important to recognize when either of these things are happening. Okay, are you a motivation or are you imposing your ideas, uh, ideals on a population? If you get into the motives of your people instead of apo- imposing your own ideals upon them, you can go beyond motivation and get into initiative. And I'll tell you, that's where you want people to be. If we're talking about teaching uh, young people lessons for life, developing initiative within those athletes is essential, right? That's become another really big theme in the work we do is uh, we can't be counted on to motivate all the time. Motivation is a pull. You're always banking on being pulled where it is that you want to go or think you should go. That, that's a faulty, uh, it, it just doesn't work. There will inevitably come a time where the motivation is not, not there in the way that we see it or think about it. Right? If it takes a, a YouTube video saying, you know, if, if you care, you don't sleep or whatever. You've, heard, you've all heard stuff like that. It takes a YouTube video to get you out of bed in the morning. Something is wrong, right? And that's worth investigating. You've got to get to the root of what's actually going on. You can't bank on motivation. Motivation is a pull. Inif- initiative, on the other hand, uh, that's internal drive. And that's what we want to develop. Self-determination theory, intrinsic motivation, all that kind of stuff. It's valuable. It's probably being talked about at this conference in a variety of ways. But really, it just comes down to, can you pick up your freaking foot and put it down one in front of the other and go? Literally. We're really, uh, Alex and I are very lucky, we, we, uh, we've got a podcast going, and we are lucky to talk, we're knocking on the door of 100 episodes, we've talked to some of the best in the business, Mike Ditka, Frank Beamer, uh, coaches, athletes, etc., and it is amazing to hear their life stories, especially on the early end, because they're always, in every one of their lives, comes a time when they have to be very humble, they're volunteering or something like that, it's early mornings, it's late, late nights, and they are not motivated necessarily to do what they're doing. They recognize their purpose, and they just put one foot in front of the other. You roll out of bed. You put your feet on the floor. Step one. If we can instill that in people, we're in a really good spot. But the truth is, what makes sports so special is uh, players need both. They need mo- both motivation and initiative. And you can imagine that. If you, if you are able to set a culture and frame an experience that, so it develops initiative in your people, and they're putting one foot in front of the other and going and going, and then you add a little juice to it, and you pull, and you motivate, and you rev the engine. Now you're going to hyperdrive. Now you're going to a place that, that they would not have otherwise experienced, and that is what's so special about sports. Right? You are doing things that you would not have been able to do otherwise. Are you a hard worker? Sure. You'll be even harder if we as coaches uh, show you how to work, where to go, and pull you along when you need it, when you get stuck. That's where it really becomes magic. How to do it is the key to all this stuff that we're talking about today. We call it character by design. The first step in character by design in any coach who wants to sort of take this into your place is to answer this question. Identify what's essential to you. And you can't, you can't go forward until you recognize that. So I, I mean this. I think if anyone has moment, uh, some time to reflect this weekend, what is important to you, if you can put it down in a set of bullet points, and if you can make it hierarchical, like in, in order of importance, I think you'll be in a really good spot. I'll give you a quick, I don't have a slide for it, but I'll just tell you, in the weight room that I run, we have more than 2,000 weekly visits. It is, a, it is a heavy turnover, high volume, lots of kids. We have five points, and feel free to steal this, okay? This is site-specific, but I think, it, I think it can apply to a lot of sp- spaces. Safety is always number one. Safety is always number one. It's safety, character, community, leadership, performance, in that order. 
And I'll tell you, I just uh, sent a message to my staff back home. We'll never tip the order. They are telling me about some, some issues that we had in the weight room last night when I was here. Um, and all we do is come back to the order. What's essential to us? We're going to keep kids safe. We're going to enhance character. We're going to establish community. And if all we do is that, we've put them in a better spot. Now, if we can teach them that and then teach them how to lead, we're in a way better spot. And then you add performance to that mix, and it's like, it's like, it's like cooking with gas. I'm telling you, and the, but, but if you ever invert those priorities, if you ever go performance over safety, say, obvious enough, and you break a kid, that's a mistake. It's a mistake that is really tough to get back from. So what's important to you? Identify what's essential to you within your program. I'm telling you right now, just to get sort of meta about this, start applying this to the relationships in your life, and I think things might be... Um, a little clearer and easier to communicate uh, about there as well. The second part, and this is the character by design workshops and where they come from, identify the shared purpose of your team. What's important to you? What is the shared purpose of your team? We do this in, in like an actual team workshop. We get students to identify what is important to them, why they started playing sports, what they enjoy most about the experience, what barriers have they experienced while in the environment that they are currently in, and we harvest all that information to create a shared purpose for that team. Where that team's purpose and the coach's uh, essential anchors overlap, that is essentially the overarching mission and motivation of that group. At least that's where it starts. If you, just so you know, if you want to see this in practice, in action, we're doing it at uh, 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, we got another workshop for this. And this is a moment to reflect, and if anyone um, can't answer yes to this, you are totally forgiven. There is no judgment here. But I think about this all the time, and I ask coaches to reflect on this all the time. Do you actually want to teach life lessons? So often we hear that sports teach life lessons. That is not true. Okay? Sports don't teach life lessons. You teach life lessons. Let's not mix that up. Football taught me how to play football. Okay? At moments, maybe at best, it taught me how to be tough. But it was my coaches. It was my teammates. It was the cultures that I was a part of. It was the situations that I was in and had to overcome. It was the experience directed by people like you that taught me whatever life lessons I got out of it. Sports alone don't teach life lessons. And we, we really bank on this because I think that takes way too much ownership off of us. Okay, when you say every athlete's got to be in a strength and conditioning program, sure, I would agree with that. But I would say it's way more important that every, every athlete should be in a strength and conditioning program directed by a really thoughtful educator. And that will make this uh, a, a, an atmosphere wherein life lessons can actually be learned. They've got the potential to teach life lessons. I referenced that classroom I was in. They have great potential. They have great power. Okay, but if you aim that in the wrong direction... Okay, I've literally heard this, by the way, just for sake of sharing. I have literally heard, get to the quarterback and break his effing neck on a high school football field, and that is a mistake. Sports have the potential to teach life lessons. Whatever you input in that situation, okay, that's the life lesson that's being learned. This could go in any direction you want. Does your behavior match your goal? But that's the question. The only way you can really ask that question is identifying, uh, is, is owning the behavior, your behavior, and owning the goal. What is your goal? <clears throat> Stephanie Jones runs a lab out of Harvard University. She works with uh, a guy named Rick Weisbord on a, on a nonprofit organization called Making Caring Common. They do a lot of fantastic work. We're lucky to have them as advisors to the project. I hope it, SEL is probably a familiar thing, social emotional learning. Uh, if you have any interest in that, they've put together a project. Stephanie was the, the lead on this where they, uh, they brought together a, a ton of SEL frameworks and started to identify alignments between them. It's really, really powerful work. So all these really bright people investigating the character qualities and capacities that might lead to long-term success and where, where's, the, where's the overlap within that? And I will tell you, uh, if you can do these three things for people, you're probably in a better spot. If you can help people, uh, if you can create self-awareness, purpose, and self-management within your population, I want you to embody this as well, you are going to set people up for success, period. Self-awareness, purpose, and self-management. Think about that in any decision you make in your life. Something as simple um, as what to have for lunch, when to wake up, when to go to bed. Self-aware, purpose-driven, and then self-management, the, the uh, ability to sort of manage one's behavior. And it's at the intersection of these things 
that the sort of ideal behaviors begin to erupt. And those are the behaviors that you have to hold up against your goals. So I hope you, yes, take all these. These are, these are frameworks that have become very useful tools in the field. So are you being self-aware in the moment? Are you present? Are you thoughtful? Are you looking accurately at the situation? Do you have a purpose? Do you know in which direction you are aiming? Do you know why you want to do the thing that you are about to do? And self-management, you could loosely put that into the category of discipline. Can you make the hard self-managing decision in the, in the context of those other two, in the presence of your, your purpose, or not? Identifying which one of those areas needs the most work has been one of the most effective things that we've been able to do. Someone might not know what their purpose is. Great, let's work there. They might be lacking discipline. I think we assume a lot of times that people don't have discipline. Maybe so. But, it's, but you, discipline only in respect to what they themselves are trying to go get. You know, if someone doesn't want to go to bed early, then they don't have a lack of discipline for not going to bed early. They have to, identify, they have to be self-aware, identify that's a goal of theirs, and then do it. If that makes sense. Something as simple as eating a salad. Now, there might be some carnivore diet um, aficionados in the audience. I don't know if that's a, a popular thing these days, so maybe you don't think eating a salad is healthy. But say someone wants to eat a salad for sake of being healthy. It's as simple as this. Become self-aware. Be present in the moment. Don't let hunger overtake you. Remember what your purpose is. Your purpose should probably be something bigger than salad. It should be lifelong health and wellness, uh, nutrition for sport, whatever it might be. Why am I making these decisions? And then do the hard work of making the decision. That's self-management. Pick the salad over the Oreos when both of them are sitting there for you. I've referenced Oreos a couple times um, because I know my weaknesses. But that is how it's got to go, all right? Uh, And and although that seems like a lot of work, it gets much, much easier over time. You can't, it's hard to do mindfulness before every meal, okay? And remind yourself of your purpose and then, and then self-manage beyond that. But here's what happens sort of in the brain. This has been a powerful metaphor in my life. I hope it, it resonates with you. Picture the brain as a forest, the most complicated, interwoven, like deep forest you could ever imagine. And to get from point A to point B, oftentimes you're going to have to literally carve a path, chop down uh, branches, whatever, and carve your own path. Now, every subsequent time you do that, the path is far more clear. You can travel it a little easier. You can walk the path that you have carved. Okay, so if self-management, purpose, uh, self-awareness, if that seems tricky, uh, take comfort in the fact that eventually you do it often enough. If you're thoughtful enough, it just becomes a healthy habit. And that's what we want to aim for. I see you smiling. You went ahead too fast. Uh, because the opposite of this is um, mindless habits. But look, this is totally natural, okay? Recognize that, too. When you are hungry, what is your number one goal? This is through the perspective of the body and survival. Your number one goal is not eat healthy when you're hungry. Your number one goal, the trigger, is to get you to eat something. It's to, it's to become satiated. It's to fill the gap, or, you know, hunger is a stimulus that doesn't necessarily lead you in the direction of good choices, okay? So you, you are creating habits, just like you are teaching life lessons, and they're either going to be good, healthy ones that are done intentionally, or mindless ones that happen just because. And I'll tell you, the more you ingrained, uh, you ingrained mindless habits, the different is, uh, more difficult it is to uproot. Use that same forest metaphor, Now you've carved this path sort of unintentionally, this mindless path through the forest of the Oreos, right? And you've got to literally, all of a sudden, even though that's super freaking easy, you've got to take a hard right eventually because your priorities have changed. So the more you engage in mindless habits, the more difficult it is to create healthy ones, but it's totally doable if you're equipped with those three abilities. Self-awareness, purpose, self-management. So uh, purpose is the big one we found over and over and over. People want to do something. When you ask them what they want to do, they have a hard time articulating it. Why do you want to go to college? Why do you want to win a championship? These are all very relevant questions, and it's, it's funny. We've, we've uh, gathered data from hundreds, or if not thousands, of student-athletes, like we said, and some of the answers, some of the purpose uh, answers to the question, what is your purpose, might surprise you. They don't want to win a championship sometimes as bad as you do. Sometimes they do. But I'll tell you, an astounding number of young people get into sports, number one, to have fun. That's obvious enough. But two is, is a, kind of a heartwarming one, if you really think about it. They get into it because they want to make friends. Or they want to be around their friends. Go back to when you were 13. Right? They want to they, they be 
part of a group. We're all very tribal in nature. They want to be part of a group. They want to make friends. So if we are jamming, if we are imposing championship-based uh, motivations down people's throats, it might work for some. And I think the idea of identifying what one's purpose is is an essential one. <clears throat> this is a real quick one. I threw this in sort of last minute because I wanted to give it to everybody. If, if you want to write this down, I think it's very helpful in troubleshooting. Un UMA. Understanding, motivation, and access. When we try to solve problems for people, when we try to help people work through their own concerns, we always look through these three areas. Okay, we do a lot of work on the south side of Chicago. Everyone thinks that there's an access issue on the south side of Chicago. Uh, people don't have access to the things they need to be successful. That much is true more often than not, to be honest. But we ask ourselves the secondary question, do they also understand how the complicated pieces of, of these things fit together, and are they motivated to do so? If a student does, does not understand that an apple instead of a bag of Cheetos might help them get to the back end of, of their athletic goals better, then even if they had access to it, they wouldn't necessarily do it. And this is, so this has been a really helpful uh, framework for us. Understanding motivation and access. Does your behavior match your goal? <coughs> Let's see, what kind of, what kind of time, does anyone have a clock on them, a watch? Oh, that's, is that a countdown? You guys are so good at this. This is not your first conference. <clears throat> Psychology and environment are essential. We know that. My sister is a, um, a classroom teacher. She's a third grade teacher, and she puts a lot of thought in the environment that she creates to stimulate a certain sort of mindset, collaboration, whatever it is that she's after. Psychology and environment uh, overlap very directly, and that much is obvious. One of the things that we do within the project and in all our initiatives is recognize where physiology fits into this whole picture. I think it's one of the most under-recognized components of student success um, that exists. You know this. Have you ever been really, really hungry? So hungry that it took you out of a state of self-awareness or it took you away from your purpose? I think the, the answer is yes. Have you ever been so tired that you were short with someone you loved? These are obvious things. Physiology, recognizing the role of the body in decision making, in the outcomes in one's behavior, is essential. Talk about access again. <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to get too intense or choked up here, but this is a serious thing in my life. We're on the south side of Chicago, and we have a student who is, is fueled by Cheetos and Mountain Dew. And has a very stressful home life and slept on a couch at one friend's house one night, another friend's house the other night. And they have a baby in the living room. And this is coming from a very real situation. And their physiological state is thrown significantly. Then when you talk about like the decision making that maps out, that, that comes from that, that comes from that state, I, it's just a totally different ballpark. And I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say that either, you know, the decisions that come out of any given situation are right or wrong. I don't think decisions coming from a, an exhausted physiological state um, are necessarily forgivable. But we should work to understand um, in, our, in our judgment of all these things. This is uh, recognizing that truth is what led to the development of this framework. And it's one of the most important things that we've put together as a group. It's called the High Order Performance Framework. And I'll explain how it works. The pinnacle of, of uh, I think, any experience, a relationship, an athletic event, an athletic experience, whatever it might be, is some version of a high-order performance goal, okay? Winning a championship, that's a very high-order performance goal. That's not regular. Most people just don't do that. I would even go as far as to say navigating um, a lunchroom at the, as a high school adolescent can be a really high-order performance goal. There's a lot of complicated stuff going on there. But all these high order performance goals, whatever it is that one wants, that's up at the pinnacle of the pyramid, okay, of the framework. And if you want to just sort of coast along with me through this framework, imagine what one of your high order performance goals might be. Just to kind of put this into context, just below it are the gap capacities. Usually we look into the SEL literature, the social emotional learning, grit, growth mindset, deliberate practice, conscientiousness, anything that would fit into that category to get someone from where they are to where they want to be, to the high order performance goals. That's where all that work, and I would suggest that, if I can figure out how to work this, yep. That is where most of the stuff on Instagram is happening. The big goals, the max deadlift, right? Then just below that, growth mindset uh, and all those other capacities, that's becoming, at least in certain circles, more and more popular to discuss and talk about. And it's all really, really important, but what we neglect too often are the two essential tiers that come just below it, right? 
language, communication, and relationships. You can't get to the top level if you can't do those things and do them well. And then below that, the absolute, what we call bedrock of this whole thing is your physiological self. Eat, move, sleep. And all you have to do to recognize how important that stuff is is imagine yourself without, any, with, without them. If you are hungry or malnourished, sedentary, and sleep deprived, how possibly could you get up there? Still, we have schools where vending machines are filled with Cheetos and Doritos and Mountain Dew and garbage. We have school start times that, that uh, go against CDC and, and, and National Sleep Foundation recommendations. We are putting people in a really, really tough spot, and I would challenge us as coaches to reconsider our 6 a.m. start times. Now, all I'm saying is reconsider. I'm not passing judgment. We have some 6.30 start times at our place. It's a logistical concern. It's an issue, truly. But we educate heavily on the front end. We really, we'll send out reminds, we'll send out group, group text, group messaging to make sure that people are in bed on time and at least have a sufficient sleep opportunity, or, or that's what we try to do. Worth considering all this stuff. If anyone's looking close at what these are, that's a focused attention practice, which has to sort of escalate um, as, as a situation becomes increasingly complex. And over here is a conversation in ethics. That is what we bring to the table. Uh, it, ethics, not morality. So we're not imposing any sort of moral judgment aligned with any, anything. We are just encouraging a conversation in ethics. If your high order performance goal is a championship, for that you want to eat well. I don't think that gives you uh, an excuse to steal someone else's food in order to eat well. I don't think you can slash the tires on the other team's bus in order to win a championship. So some sort of conversation in ethics is necessary. And just as one final comment on this, um, because, it, again, it really is meaningful in a lot of the work that we do. Who here has been hungry before? Okay, yeah. You've never, you've never been starving may have used the word starving because you had an, you know, you had an early flight and you didn't get to eat and you went to whatever. I'm starving right now. You've never actually been starving. But just to give you an example of why this conversation is so necessary to our filter and how we see the world and why that bedrock level is so necessary. If you were actually starving, if your life depended on it, your ethics would change and you know it. Especially if you have a family. Think about that. I think that probably provides some really important context. We want to make sure, understanding motivation access, that we create situations where that is not the case as often as possible. Okay, growth mindset. Who's heard of growth mindset? I, I assume most, if not all. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up in a very specific and easy to digest way. The seminal studies uh, coming out of Carol Dweck's lab, she was at Stanford. She was also very gracious to lend some of her time on the build of the Good Athlete Project. She's a very kind woman and did some, uh, did some meaningful research. Growth mindset is one of the staple character development components that you'd want to give someone. It essentially looks like this. Two math classrooms, and I might butcher the study, but here it goes. Two math classrooms. One of those math classrooms, both of them are advanced, used to getting A's. One of those groups is uh, patted on the back every time they succeed and get an A, and they're told, fantastic job. You've done it again. You're so talented. You're so good at math. You're so smart. They're really heavily encouraged. The other group is told, fantastic job, you've done it again, you must have worked so hard. You must have taken advantage of all the extra study opportunities, you must have, whatever it might have been. They're patted on the back uh, and, and their process is highlighted over their outcome. Obvious enough. Down the road, the, all these students are faced with a, a barrier, it's an unpassable test, and for the first time in their life they've failed. And then the, the, the magic of these studies is all they do is look at the responses of the kids. What do they do next? They both failed. What do they do next? Group A, which was told how good they were, they, self-doubt starts to creep in. Maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Maybe, maybe I'm not as good at, at math. And worse still, maybe the people who told me that were wrong. Can I trust them anymore? In the second group, they come back to a state of self-awareness which is exactly, like I said, what you'd want to cultivate. They come back to a state of self-awareness, and they say, where did I go wrong in my process? Gosh, you know, I watched Netflix for like two hours the other night. Maybe that wasn't the right call. You become self-aware, right? Growth mindset, in other words, how to frame and interact with setbacks in one's life, you could argue, is essential for all of us. As we move on to the next slide... Let's go ahead and recognize that if you don't eat, if you're trying to use growth mindset as a gap capacity to get you to your highest order self, 
but you don't eat, move, or sleep well, I will tell you without going to all the science of it, if you don't eat, move, or sleep well, then your ability to communicate, your relationships, uh, the language that you are able to use, that will start to degrade. And if you can't use language well, and one very easy way to kind of embody this, imagine yourself on three hours of sleep, okay? How good were you at communicating the next day? It's very, very simple. It happens all the time. Uh, if you take away those abilities, then you've put an automatic barrier uh, in, in when it comes to access to those gap capacity. If you, if you can't use language well to frame a situation, you can't get into growth mindset. You cannot use it, right? And that's where you have sort of pervasive uh, negative attitudes. So it's essential. We got to be doing it all the time. If anyone's got questions, I'm at the back stretch of this. If anyone's got questions, uh, I w I'll try to toss you this situation right here. Uh, I'm also totally happy to hang back and talk all day. Uh, when it comes to motivation and understanding, here's a quick sort of anecdote to give to your kids. We tracked a swim team. We're trying to get people to address the bedrock component of the high order performance framework. We tracked a swim team over the course of the year. Tracked them how long they slept and how much they improved over the course of the season. Well, what we found very simply was uh, if you slept less than six and a half hours on average over the course of a swim season, you were four times more likely to finish in the bottom half of the team in terms of performance improvement. So this is something you can kind of give to kids and just ask them to confront. Okay, fine. You think it's, it, uh, you don't understand how this all fits together. Do you, and, and you don't worry about your language, communication, relationships, whatever. Do you want to be a good swimmer? Do you want to be a good football player? Whatever it might be, then you might want to do this because if not, you're just not going to get better over the course of this season. And what happened, uh, a, a kind of interesting insight into the psychology of these athletes, it's not that they weren't performing well. You know, one of these underrested athletes might have been on the podium collecting medals. They just weren't getting any better compared to their teammates. There's a very real drop-off in improvement. We call that the talent delusion. If you're on the medal stand, in spite of your own sort of self-deprivation, that's called the talent delusion. There's no clear feedback from the world showing you where your uh, inadequacies are or the, or the gaps in, in your potential are. I'm going to throw this out to you um, and just fast forward to the end. How does sleep loss impact cognition? If you want to be a good coach, you're going to have to think well. Fair enough. If you want to understand a playbook, your kids are going to have to think well. Cognition. If you sleep zero hours for one night, pulling an all-nighter, this is coming out of a study at UC Berkeley, uh, lapses in concentration, missed responses, increase 400% if you pull an all-nighter. So cramming for a test does not work. Uh, four hours a night for six consecutive nights, same drop. Four hours a night for 11 nights, matched back-to-back all-nighters. And this is when it starts to get scary. Six hours of sleep for 10 consecutive nights, not even a week and a half. We go into some places where people say, man, 10 for, for two weeks, or excuse me, six hours for 10 days, I'd feel pretty good about that. Well, it's still a 400% uh, knock on your ability to perform cognitively. <clears throat> the lead researcher on this project made this comment. Uh, those in that six-hour group consistently underestimated their degree of performance disability. That, again, from a professional sense, is a talent delusion. You can all get through your day on six hours of sleep. No question. Absolutely. Will you be as good as you could have otherwise been? No chance. Absolutely. Right? These are just things to kind of consider, and then you just come back to that, does my behavior match my goal question. Now, so many things to consider. This is a kicking off point. This is a sharing of frameworks and research, uh, resources. It's a way of thinking, stimulating a way of thinking. And I'm telling you, when you do it, remember this part. You don't always have to be right. You should operate thoughtfully. Have humility in the presence of setbacks. Forgive yourself and those around you and be willing to adapt. Uh, I'm going to gloss through, because of time, the nutrition stuff. But I will say that I spoke at a, a, a state conference for wrestling recently. And psychological toughness is a high priority. But also... Cutting weight is a component of the sport, and it's important to recognize that if you're asking your kids to get up at five for sake of uh, developing mental toughness, fine, but recognize that what you're doing on a hormonal level is making their cut far more difficult. You invert um, the production of certain hormones in the body. I also, by the way, I am going to put this slide up. Jeez, I'm pretty convinced that um, if it weren't for a massively sleep-deprived, uh, under-rested, way-too-convenient society Nonsense like this wouldn't even exist. Seriously, go back 40, 50 years. Did you, could anyone have uh, guessed that there would have been an Oreo pizza someday? That's nonsense. And this is a legitimate question. Has anyone actually had an Oreo pizza? Don't lie. 
I see a lot of people scratching their beards, not willing to go all the way up. I got a nose over here that's, that's like halfway hand raised. What that means is you haven't had one, but you would if it was in front of you. And that's fine. I forgive you. This is the magic of the character by design model. If you're willing to do all of this good thinking, and again, we're going to put this all into action at 2 o'clock and show you how to do it for, for your place if you'd like to volunteer. Identifying what you want. Remember, that's what you need, essential components of your place. Identifying what your kids want. That's always step one. Always step one. Identifying goals, which are not ends in and among themselves. Like, they are signposts along the way to fulfilling the group purpose. But do identify goals, okay? And then the behaviors, context, and habits which lead into those, this is what you must do. And it's, maybe it sounds obvious, but when we have that complicated, remember the, uh, the grocery store picture, that complicated situation of modern life, uh, we oftentimes forget it. What do you want? Say it's win a championship. What are one of the sub-tier goals? We got you know, to go 10-0 and 0 in the regular season, whatever it might be. What are the behaviors? What are the contexts, including the barriers to access of the, of, for those behaviors? Uh, And then what are the habits that come out of that? That's the way to do it. And the trick to everything that we try to get involved in is that we recognize that that when you light the candle at the back end of a process, maybe we're going to win a championship someday. That's your purpose. Those are your goals. All these kids are really jacked up, that big bench press idea, about these perhaps in the grand scheme of things semi-artificial goals and outcomes. We have to do our best as educators to make sure that whether or not they achieve that, all the behaviors and habits, the habits and behaviors they do on a day-to-day basis, ingraining healthy habits instead of mindless ones, that all of those fuel a life of health and wellness, a life of high character. This is where the life lessons happen. You don't, if, you, if you hit this, if you nail that, you get your championship ring. But these don't lend themselves to, to actual life lessons, very intentional life lessons, then you're freaking Tim McGraw and Friday Night Lights. Is that still relevant, that movie? That alone is not enough, and the truth is, and you all know this, is that's the 1%. Not everyone gets that. Not everyone gets the championship. Not everyone hits their goal. But if they're with you for nine months or a year, for the course of four years, then this should happen in such a way that they are just better off for it. We're going to go over this framework um, in the workshop. I'll show you literally how to use it, how to identify what's right for you in your place. Uh, it's 2 o'clock, and I believe it's over in the hands-on area. Uh, but if, again, if you've got any questions... I truly do hope you will reach out. Thank you all for being here today.